finding Jesus in the Old Testament. What we want to do is be true to the scriptures as opposed to try to manufacture things that are not there, that are exciting and amazing. What we want to do is do our best to be fair to the scriptures and to say, where can we rightly find Jesus Yeshua in the Hebrew Bible? Some years back, probably the early 90s, there was an Orthodox Jewish man from Israel who had come to faith in Jesus and had come over to the States with his family. He knew very little English. I was the main one that was supposed to speak in Hebrew with him, but my modern Hebrew is not as strong as my biblical Hebrew. So he was coming to one of my classes that I was teaching on Messianic prophecy. And we were going through the Hebrew scriptures comprehensively to see where there are legitimate prophecies of Jesus there. And he could only understand some of the class in English, but we were looking at the Hebrew Bible a lot. And while the class was going on, because he didn't understand some of it, he was just reading through the scriptures in Hebrew. And every so often, he'd raise his hand and he'd say, I think that this is Jesus. And he'd point to a verse and I thought, what? I, I never saw that as pointing to Jesus. And what it was, was he had a rabbinic way of reading the scripture. And, and his rabbinic way of reading the scripture, the way he grew up in that everything is a reference to God's law and God's teaching and God's commandments. And now he just kind of took over that mindset and every passage is like every line was about Jesus. And I found it so interesting. It reminds me of the story of a guy that was in seminary and he, he comes into class, he's a little bit distracted, and, and the professor is talking. He says, you will not believe what I saw on the way into class today. He said he was just sitting there with his little belly and, and his furry tail, and he was just so cute. And the guy in the back, the distracted, he goes, I know, it's Jesus. It's always Jesus. <laughs> He's talking about some squirrel, he saw something, but the guy thought, it's always, you're always going to make it about Jesus. That's not our goal. I, I have heard bizarre things such as in Exodus, the 17th chapter, when Aaron and Hur held up the hands of Moses, and when his hands were held up, that Israel triumphed over the Amalekites as Joshua did battle, that, that his hands were held in the sign of the cross, uh, aside from the fact that there's zero evidence of that, aside from the fact that that's an illogical way to stand on either side and hold someone's hands up, it's one of those things where we needlessly are trying to read something into the scripture that's not there. Or, for example, Exodus, the 15th chapter, it talks about when the children of Israel came to the waters, the, the undrinkable water, the waters of Marah, that God instructs Moses to throw a tree into the water. And when the tree was thrown into the water, it made the bitter waters sweet, right? Well, rabbinic exegesis, rabbinic interpretation, always looking for references to God's Torah, God's law, sees that it says that Moses, he, he threw, he cast the tree into the water. And that word Yoreh is apparently related to Torah, Torah teaching. They said, you see, it's the, the teaching of the law that makes the bitter water sweet. Just reading something to the text that's not there. But in the same way, early church fathers looked at the text and said, wait a second. It's the tree that's thrown into the waters and the tree speaks of the cross. And this is speaking of the cross making the bitter water sweet. No, no, that's just as wrong. It's just reading things into the text that aren't there. But on the other hand, we know that the New Testament authors are constantly pointing back to what is written. And, and that the primary credentials for Jesus being the Messiah are not the signs, wonders, and miracles. They are important, but they are simply confirming that he is the one <clears throat> spoken of in the Hebrew Bible. So, so just take a look at a few passages with me in the New Testament, all right? We'll start in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. This is right at the beginning of Yeshua's ministry. And it says in verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, 
we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So they are immediately identifying him with someone spoken of in Scripture, in particular spoken about by Moses and the prophets. When you get to John, the fifth chapter, Jesus is rebuking some of the religious leaders. And look at, look at what he says to them. Beginning in verse 45. John 5, 45. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Jesus is explicitly saying that Moses wrote about him, meaning in the five books of Moses. Now, if, if you look in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, verse 17, notice what Jesus says there, Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. In other words, everything that comes before me is ultimately pointing towards me, and I will not nullify it or abolish it. I will rather bring it to its fullest meaning. After he dies and rises from the dead, there are two amazing accounts in Luke's gospel, beginning in, verse, in chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, when Jesus meets the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, begins to talk with them. It says in verse 16, but they were kept from recognizing him. Remember, he's died, he's risen from the dead, but at this point it's just a rumor that he's risen from the dead. These disciples are downcast because they really thought that Jesus was the Messiah and was going to bring about radical change for the nation. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then he meets with his 11 disciples. And it says in verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So when he speaks of the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, he's most likely pointing to a threefold division of what we call the Old Testament. The way we have the Old Testament, we have a fourfold division. How, how is it divided in our Bibles? We have first the, the law of Moses, right, the five books. Then we have the historical books, beginning with Joshua, Judges. Then we have the wisdom and poetry literature, so Psalms, Job, Proverbs. Then we have the prophetic books, ending with 
Malachi, the ancient tradition that's followed in other Jewish circles, that, that reflects one ancient Jewish order. Another ancient Jewish order divides the Bible into three parts, the Old Testament into three parts. So the law of Moses and then the prophets, which include Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets. Daniel's not listed there. And then what's called the writings, which is everything else. And the most prominent book in the writings is Psalms. It seems that that's what Jesus is saying here, where it refers to the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, meaning the whole of the Old Testament, the whole of the Hebrew Bible. And by the way, if you've ever heard reference to the Tanakh and wondered what is the Tanakh, that's the Jewish way of saying the Old Testament. To a Jewish person, it's not the Old Testament, this is the Bible, right? So Tanakh stands for those three Hebrew divisions. The T is Torah, which is teaching or law, meaning the five books of Moses. The N is Nevi'im, meaning prophets. So that's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets. And the last, Ketuvim, is writings. And just, if you get online and just search for Tanakh, T-A-N-A-K-H, you'll find that information. So Torah, the five books of Moses, Nevi'im, the prophets, and spell it however you like because you're writing in English, not Hebrew, so spell it however you can remember how to pronounce it. Nevi'im, prophets, and then Ketuvim, the writings, that's everything else. That's the order that's, that's followed in Hebrew Bibles. We follow the order from the ancient Greek translation called the Septuagint. So again, same books, just different order for some of them, but the exact same books. Point is here, he's saying that what happened in my life, my death and my rejection and my resurrection, this was foretold in the Hebrew Scriptures. If it wasn't foretold in the Hebrew Scriptures, we could rightly ask, well, who are you? Why should we believe you? Why should we consider you to be the Messiah? Obviously, the foundation is what is written, and everything had to be tested by what is written, and it is to that that Jesus pointed. And you see, when, when you get to the preaching in the book of Acts, that yes, they declared his resurrection, and yes, they declared the witness of the power of the Spirit, but the foundation of their preaching was on what is written. So in Peter's message in Acts chapter 2, he first points back to Joel 2, the outpouring of the Spirit, that the prophet Joel spoke about. Then he quotes from Psalm 16, and he quotes from Psalm 110. In fact, Psalm 110 is the most quoted passage from the Old Testament of any. Speaking of the Messiah being raised up to sit at God's right hand until his enemies be made a footstool. If you look at Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 3, he quotes from Deuteronomy 18 about God raising up a prophet like Moses. And then he says this in Acts 3.24, Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. So in order for our faith to stand, we must be able to make a legitimate case for Jesus Yeshua being clearly prophesied in the Hebrew Bible, being the one of whom Moses and the prophets spoke. So let's start then in the law. And let's ask where and when did Moses speak about Jesus? Now, some point to God's acts and creation and the spirit working in creation and light shining in darkness and things like that, but that's certainly nothing that you could present to a Jewish person and say, see, look at this. You should believe in Jesus based on this. We get to Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, and there's the famous word in verse 15 where God tells the snake, I'll put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He'll crush your head and you'll strike his heel. Some have said that this is clearly a prophecy of the Messiah because Satan was greater than man and it was Satan working through the, the snake and therefore they needed someone greater than man to defeat the snake. I remember teaching an adult Sunday school class in the church in which I was saved. And if you're just reading this in context, your, your immediate response would be, it's, it's a prophecy about human beings killing snakes and the hostility between man and snake, etc. And the snake striking the human being's heel. 
I don't think that just reading it first time or hearing it the first time, you'd be thinking Messianic prophecy. So I was, I was teaching an adult Sunday school class on Messianic prophecy, maybe three, four years old in the Lord. And I don't know, maybe 10 people in the class. And I said, I know it's impossible for us to do this, to go back and take away everything we know. But, but if you could picture being Adam and Eve and hearing this word spoken, would you have interpreted it as a messianic prophecy? In other words, is there, is there anything in the text? Here, here, verse 14, the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, deceived the, the woman, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You'll crawl on your belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He'll crush your head and you'll strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I'll greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you'll give birth to your children, etc." I said, if you just heard that, if you're Adam and Eve hearing those words, would you have taken it to be a messianic prophecy? I remember one dear brother raised his hand and said, well, if I was Adam and Eve, I would realize that the snake was too powerful for me, and I would need someone greater than me to kill the snake, and therefore I would see this as a prophecy that God himself would take on human form and destroy the snake. <laughs> so hang on. You, you would see this as a prophecy of the incarnation, one of the greatest mysteries of all that God did, God taking on human form. You would see that prophesied right here in an unbiased way. I, I, I mean, the, the thought of it was, uh, it was wonderful in that he was such a committed believer and, and saw things so clearly that he couldn't see it any other way. But to look at this as a direct messianic prophecy I think is a mistake to look at it as ultimately pointing forward to a, a larger triumph of God over, over Satan. I would see that, and Paul quotes it in Romans 16, that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your foot with imagery here. But to look at it as a direct messianic prophecy, I, I think is a mistake. Also, when it talks about I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. People said, well, a woman doesn't have seed. This is a prophecy of the virgin birth. Uh, again, I would strongly question that. I would say here where it says seed, it just means offspring. By the way, I'm not sure what those sounds are, uh, but if there's anything that I'm doing or can do differently, just let us know. By the way, this is the difference between a Baptist church and a charismatic church. Baptist church, it's a technical problem. Charismatic church, it's demonic attack. If it keeps happening, we know it's demonic, right? <laughs> okay. So when does Moses speak about Jesus? Genesis 3.15 could be a distant reference. I wouldn't look at it as a clear prophecy. The first time I would say is, is in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, where the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. Go to the land, and I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you, and I'll make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I'll curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Here's the promise to Abraham's seed that through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And this is reiterated to Isaac and to Jacob. So, in other words, this is not just a promise of Abram's future greatness, and he'll be Abraham and the father of Isaac and the father of Jacob, who's the, the father of the nation of Israel. No, it, it will be more than that. Through your seed, the whole world will be blessed. When Paul says in Galatians 3 that, that the gospel was preached to Abraham, I believe this is what it's talking about. This reference that through your seed, the whole world will be blessed. And if we jump ahead to Genesis chapter 49, Genesis chapter 49, as Jacob is prophesying to his sons before he dies, in verse 9, Genesis 49, 9, you are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? So this is a prophecy to Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. Some translations say until Shiloh comes. And the obedience 
of the nations is his. So there you have the nations again who will now be obedient to this one who comes from the line of Judah. So this is just to say that within Genesis, we have a, pro a promise of the whole world being blessed through the seed of Abraham. And now specifically, we're told that the ruler that will come will come from the line of Judah. And the peoples, the nations, again, peoples, nations, the whole world will be obedient to him. So this is something of, of great significance, especially because the authority that was given to Judah, the rulership authority through the line of David, ceased many centuries ago, and therefore this prophecy had to come to pass before that time. But just to say this, the promise of universal blessing, the whole world being blessed through the seed of Abraham, and then specifically the rulership and leadership coming through Judah that will bring worldwide obedience, we now have the foundation of messianic prophecy. Also in the book of Genesis, we have the account of the binding of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. In Judaism, it's well known as the Akedah, A-K-E-D-A-H. Akedah, A-K-E-D-A-H, meaning binding, <coughs> excuse me, Specifically, the binding of Isaac. Now, what's interesting is that in Jewish tradition, Isaac was not a little boy when this happened, which is the, the most logical reading of the text. Rather, he was a grown man of 37 years old. So in Jewish tradition, Isaac becomes an even greater hero than Abraham because Isaac willingly is laying himself down. Aha, you weren't praying hard enough. <laughs> Should we switch to the other mic? All right. Now, if it happens with... This mic, <laughs> then we start going around trying to see where the resistance is coming from. Okay, Genesis 22, the binding of Isaac. In Jewish tradition, this was viewed as if he actually died. Jewish tradition even speaks of, of the blood of Isaac or the ashes of Isaac. That's how much of a self-sacrifice this was viewed as. But the text as we have it puts the emphasis on Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his only son. And of course, God does not want human sacrifice. Jesus willingly laid his life down to die for our sins. That is different than human sacrifice, someone offering up a child. Ultimately, God did not want that. This was something that was done in the ancient world, and that probably would not have been foreign to Abraham. God didn't want that. It was a test but Abraham demonstrated his love and loyalty by his willingness to give his one and only son. The, the word in Hebrew that's used for, for one and only is the equivalent Greek word of that that's used in the New Testament when it speaks of Jesus as God's unique son or one and only son. So Abraham demonstrated his love for God by his willingness to give up his one and only son and of course, God demonstrates his love for us by giving us his one and only son. Not only so, but Isaac's willingness to go to the place of sacrifice prefigures Yeshua's willingness to go to the place of death. In fact, one Jewish tradition says as he's carrying the wood uh, for the sacrifice, for the altar, that he's going to be burned on himself or sacrificed on himself, that, that it's like he's a man going to the cross, carrying the, the cross beam. But there's something else that's interesting in the text. When, when Isaac asked the question in, in verse 7, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And then what happens a little bit after that? What do they find caught in a thicket? A ram. So it's an interesting thing that Isaac asks, where is the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide the lamb. And yet here there's a ram provided. There is a lamb still to be provided by God. And it's no surprise that when Jesus then comes on the scene, that John the Immerser, John the Baptist, sees him in John 1.29 and says, Behold the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sin of the world, and that's how he's referred to often in the New Testament. Uh, We can also look at the example of Joseph. Again, this is not quoted in the New Testament, but this could have been something that Jesus opened his disciples' eyes to see. That we know what happens to Joseph. He gets sold into slavery in Egypt, and it looks like he's going to die there. Instead, God raises him up to become the savior of the Gentile world. Yet when his own brothers see him, they don't recognize him. It's only the second time around that they see him and recognize him. He's revealed to them. So in a way, it parallels what happens to Jesus, how he is given over to the Gentile world. He's, he's looked at as the savior of the Gentile world, but not part of our family, not one of us. And then, of course, in his second coming, he'll be recognized by his own people as his own brothers recognized him on their second trip to Egypt. Again, not meant to be an exact parallel, but is there a foreshadowing there? When we we get into the book of Exodus, of course we have the Passover, and it's with the blood of the Lamb that the children of Israel are rescued, that as long as they are under the protection and covering of the blood of the Lamb, that they themselves are freed from the destroying angel that comes through and kills all the firstborn in Egypt. It's also interesting, though, that that we have certain pictures of God appearing. We have it in the book of Genesis. We have it in in the book of Exodus as well. So let's just take a look at some of these appearances. Sometimes these are called theophanies, meaning divine appearances. And, And the question is, is this the Son of God appearing in the Old Testament? Is this the Son of God making himself known in the Old Testament? So take a look, for example, in Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18, verse 1, it says, The Lord, in Hebrew, Yahweh, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Jewish tradition says, well, it was the Lord appearing through three angels. And one of them was Raphael, who was there to heal Abraham after his circumcision. Because the end of the 17th chapter said that Abraham and all the males in his household were circumcised. So Jewish tradition says that the angels were fulfilling the obligation of visiting the sick. And one of them, Raphael, was there to heal Abraham. But as you read the text, you see that Abraham is quite well at this point. is actually running around to get things done. So the idea that this is visitation of the sick after circumcision obviously doesn't work. But it doesn't just say that three angels appeared representing the Lord. It says that the Lord appeared. And as you'll read through the text, you'll see that there's a dialogue that ensues between Abraham, Sarah, and the Lord. It's back and forth conversation. You left. I didn't laugh. I heard you laugh. No, I really, it's a back and forth conversation. All right? And and then it says in verse 16, when the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom because they're there before going to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham walked along with them to see them on the way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And he speaks about how Abraham's going to become a great nation and how God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, Abraham's nephew Lot and his family are there. So there's an extensive dialogue now between Abraham and and the Lord. Extensive back and forth dialogue. And then it says this in verse 33. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. So it's it's pretty clear, right? The Lord appears to Abraham. At least one of these three men is the Lord himself speaking directly back and forth to Abraham and Sarah. Now Abraham is walking out with the men, has an extended conversation with the Lord, back and forth, extended conversation. When the conversation's done, the Lord leaves, right? Chapter 19, verse 1, the next verse. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. So what happens? Yahweh appears with two angels to Abraham, has extended conversation with him. When he's done talking with Abraham, he leaves, and the two angels go over to Sodom. When you read the text plainly, if you just take it to mean what it means, this is God appearing in earthly form in the Old Testament. 
and having an extended conversation with Abraham and eating and drinking with him. Now, when you go to the book of Exodus, you have God appearing in the, in the flame of fire, the angel of the Lord appearing in Exodus 3. But when you get to Exodus 24, there's something very significant here. Exodus 24, this is after the giving of the book of the covenant to Moses to give to the Israelites on Mount Sinai. Exodus 24, 1, then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, you, who are, to, you are to worship at a distance. But Moses alone is to approach the Lord, the others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. So here's an invitation, and it's interestingly spoken, come up to the Lord, not come up to me, but come up to the Lord as if another person is speaking. So this is now 74 people. And it says in verse 9, Moses and Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself, but God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. A divine appearance. Elsewhere, when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, you see in the fourth chapter that emphatically, over and again, God says, look, you saw no form. You saw no form on Mount Sinai. God did not reveal himself like this to the nation as a whole, but he did reveal himself to the 70 elders and the four others on Mount Sinai. They saw the God of Israel. Elsewhere, we read, you cannot see God and live. Exodus 33, God tells Moses, you can't see my face and live. You can just see my, my glory, basically, as I, as I pass by. Here it says that they saw the God of Israel, and he didn't strike them down. It wasn't just a vision, otherwise it wouldn't say he didn't strike them down. This is one of the places that we have in the Hebrew Scriptures, Genesis 18 being another important place. One of the important places where God visibly reveals himself to the children of Israel. And yet we know at the same time that God cannot be seen. How do we know it? Well, the New Testament tells us. The New Testament tells us plainly. Here, take a look with me. Take a look with me. John chapter 1. What's written in John 1? Verse 18. No one has ever seen God. That's what it says. But God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. 118, no one has ever seen God. It's pretty plain. Here's another reference, and there are more, but here's another one. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6, verse 15, speaking of God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, verse 16, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see. 1 Timothy 6:16. He dwells in unapproachable light. No one has seen him or can see him. And yet he's clearly been seen. This is one of the things that we seek to open up to Jewish people, that God is seen and unseen. He's visible and invisible. He's imminent and transcendent. He, he's, he's touchable and he's untouchable. How can this be at one and the same time? Well, God is complex in his unity. There's one God and one God only, but complex in his unity. Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father is the source of all things. All things come from Him, but no one can see Him. He dwells in unapproachable light. He reveals Himself to us through the Son, right? John 1.14, the Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, one and only of the Father. Or John 14, where Jesus says to His disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Or Colossians 1 that says he's the image of the invisible God. Or, or Hebrews 1 that he's the express representation of God. So he's hidden and yet revealed. So the Father, the source of all things, we pray to him as Abba, Father, for that reason. All things come from him. They come through the Son. He creates all things through the Son and he reveals himself through the Son. That's how we see God through the Son. And then he works invisibly among us by his spirit. These are some of the ways in which Moses spoke of Jesus. And when Jesus says in John 8 that Abraham 
saw my day and rejoiced. The question is, how did Abraham see Jesus' day and rejoice? Was it a vision that he had of crucifixion, resurrection? Possible. Possible, but that's assuming a lot. Was it something that happened with the binding of Isaac where God gave him insight? This is a prefiguring of what's going to happen with your greater seed in the future? Possible. Is it possible he saw the fruit of his worldwide rule and the whole world being blessed with him? Possible. We don't know. But we know that Jesus can say that Abraham saw his day and rejoiced. Now, when we, we get into the, the sacrificial system, we see the great principle in Leviticus 17.11 that the reason for blood atonement is because the life is in the blood. So Leviticus 17.11 tells us that's why God gave it on the altar. It's life for life, right? The innocent taking the place of the guilty. And so, for example, on the, the Day of Atonement, two animals would be sacrificed in the midst of other sacrifices, two goats, one whose blood would bring cleansing for the sins of the people of Israel, the other on whom they would lay their hands, confess the sins of Israel over it. The high priest would do this and send the goat into the wilderness, the so-called scapegoat, because it was the goat that escaped into the wilderness. And there's debate exactly how to translate the, the Hebrew word. It was the goat for Azazel, specifically what Azazel means. But the point is simply this, that the, the sins of the nation were laid on the hands of this innocent, spotless animal that then carried it away. So there's the cleansing blood, there's the carrying away of sin. This is prefiguring what Jesus does on the cross. In fact, if, if we look at the ministry of the high priest, if we look at some of the key texts in the book of Exodus about the, the high priest, the one who would intercede for the people, intercede for the nation, that he literally carried on his shoulders the, the, the burden of the tribes of Israel. He was the great interest, intercessor for the nation. And, and I want to show you something very interesting in the book of Numbers. And, and I dare say you might have read Numbers for years and never noticed this. Numbers chapter 8. The Levites here are set apart for service in the sanctuary. Numbers chapter 9. Now notice this. Verse 5. The Lord said to Moses, take the Levites from among the other Israelites and make them ceremonially clean. Goes through this. Now verse 9. Bring the Levites to the front of the tent of meeting and assemble the whole Israelite community. You are to bring the Levites before the Lord. And the Israelites are to lay their hands on them. So notice this. The Levites are brought forward because the Levites take the place of all the firstborn of Israel. Any firstborn male animal was sacrificed to the Lord any firstborn Israelite male was given over for the Lord's service. Here the Levites take their place. That's how God set it up. So notice the Levites are brought forward and the people lay their hands on the Levites. Why? Because the Levites are taking their place. Got it? Aaron is to present the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering from the Israelites so they may be ready to do the work of the Lord. So the Levites, the Israelites lay hands on them and they are set apart as an offering to the Lord. The Levites, the people, they're not killed. This is a living offering, right? So, so you lay your hands on them, they are taking your place, right? And then they are now offered up to the Lord. Now look at this, verse 12. After the Levites lay their hands on the heads of the bulls, Use the one for a sin offering to the Lord and the other for a burnt offering to make atonement for the Levites. So the children of Israel lay their hands on the Levites. The Levites lay their hands on the animals. The animals are then sacrificed on their behalf. So you can see this idea of substitution, yes, very clearly. And of and a priestly ministry or Levitical ministry taking the place of the people. Now, now look at this. Verse 19. Of all the Israelites, I've given the Levites as gifts to Aaron and his sons to do the work at the tent of meeting on behalf of the Israelites and to make atonement for them so that no plague will strike the Israelites when they go near the sanctuary. So the Levites basically, as some have said, serve as a lightning rod to attract God's wrath. If there's going to be judgment, they're the ones that are, that are there to intercede. They are the ones that are to take the place of the nation. Now, I'll show you something else very interesting. 
Numbers chapter 35. So you understand why I read that, yes? To, to give the idea of the Levites being an offering for the Israelites, taking the place of the Israelites, and then the Levites lay hands on physical offerings, animal offerings, which take their place. Substitution. Substitution. When Jesus hangs on the cross, he dies as our substitute. He, the righteous one, takes the sins of the unrighteous. So Deuteronomy 35 excuse me, Numbers 35, Numbers 35 lays out the requirements for the cities of refuge. Why? Well, if there was an accidental homicide, you needed a place for that person to flee. And, and it says this, verse 15, these six towns will be a place of refuge for Israelites, aliens, and any other people living among them so that anyone who was killed another accidentally can flee there. Now, what was, the, what was the problem? The problem was that bloodshed polluted the land. Verse 31, do not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer who deserves to die. He must surely be put to death. Verse 33, do not pollute the land where you are. Blood, bloodshed pollutes the land, and atonement cannot be made for the land on which blood has been shed except by the blood of the one who shed it. All right, so you have a problem. Someone murders a person in cold blood, the land is polluted. How can we make atonement for that? How can we fix that? Only one way. Put that person to death. Life for life. He took a life, he loses his life. Now atonement's been made in that respect. Okay, problem. Blood was shed, someone was killed, but it was accidental. It still pollutes the land, but this person can flee to the city of refuge and no one can touch him there. How long does he have to stay there? Well, the rest of his life, correct? Unless something happens. Let's just see what it says here. It tells us that, verse 25, the assembly must protect the one accused of murder from the avenger of blood, send him back to the city of refuge to which he fled. He must stay there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. So he stays in the city of refuge the rest of his life, or if the high priest dies first, he's free. Why? Because the high priest takes the place of the people, and his death substitutes for their death. And his death substitutes... So maybe you had five people in cities of refuge through accidental homicides. When the high priest dies, they all go free. And Jewish traditional literature asks the question, well, what made atonement? Was it the, the years that the man spent in exile in the city of refuge? No, it was the death of the high priest that atoned. This is in traditional Jewish literature. These are ways that Jesus can say, look, it says in Psalm 110 about the Messiah, that he'll be a priest forever after the order of, of Melchizedek. So the Messiah was to be not just a king, but also a priest. And here we see not just the Levites, taking the place of the rest of the people and being an offering for the rest of the people. But we see also here that the high priest was the representative intercessor for the nation and that his death, in that sense, had atoning power and could release people from the city of refuge. These are easily things to which Jesus could appoint it in the five books of Moses. And then, of course, there's the, the prophecy of the Messianic king and Numbers, the 22nd chapter, but that's speaking more of a, a, of a future reign. Or in, in Numbers uh, 24 in the Balaam prophecies that go from 22 to 24. And then Deuteronomy 18 is another passage that Jesus could have pointed to about a prophet like Moses that God would raise up. You say, yeah, but, but that's not talking about the Messiah. That's talking about in every generation, God would give Israel prophets. Well, that's True, but not totally true. God says, beginning in verse 9 of Deuteronomy 18, when you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, you do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. They go to necromancers and fortune tellers and all these false prophets and things. Don't go to any of them. Verse 14, the nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery and divination, but as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. 
All right, and God says in verse 18 to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. So it's basically saying, as you, as you come into the land of Canaan, I'll, I'll raise up prophets for you. You won't have to go to the soothsayers and the necromancers and these others. So certainly in every generation, there was an expectation that God would raise up a prophet or prophets who would bring the truth of the word to the people, would, would say what God was saying to the people. And yet, when we get to Deuteronomy 34, we read something very interesting. Deuteronomy 34, speaking of the death of Moses and in the years that followed, verse 10, since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So on the one hand, it says twice in Deuteronomy 18, God will raise up a prophet like Moses. But when we get to Deuteronomy 34, it says no prophet like Moses has been raised up. That's why, if you remember in the Gospels, it tells us that when John the Immerser began to, to minister, when John the Immerser began to, uh, to speak, they said to him, are you the Messiah? No, are you the prophet? Are you the pro What prophet? We know from ancient Jewish documents that there was an expectation that there would not just be a messianic figure that came to redeem Israel, but there would also be a great prophet that God raised up. And part of the anticipation goes back to Deuteronomy 18. On the one hand, it did speak of a prophet for every generation, but it also spoke of a prophet like Moses. And Deuteronomy 34 says, no prophet like that has risen up yet. Who is there and the level of Moses that, that came with such signs and wonders and miracles and, and had that intimate relationship with God. So there was an expectation of a greater prophet to come. That's why Peter quotes that and says, whoever does not listen to this prophet, this greater prophet, this prophet like Moses, Jesus, whoever does not listen to him will be cut off. So these are some of the ways in which Jesus could have opened up his disciples' eyes or challenged the religious leaders and said, look, Moses spoke about me. And you're not believing Moses because he spoke about me. Now, it's true that the New Testament writers quoted from the Old Testament in many different ways. Sometimes they quote it as direct prophecy. This prophet spoke this. David saw this in the Spirit. This is what it's talking about. Other times they're saying, as it happened to Israel so also it happened to Messiah. As it happened to Moses, as it happened to David, so also it happened to Messiah. Uh, let me give you a classic example. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. I apologize for using so much scripture while teaching the word. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, when they had gone, so Yeshua and his family, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to come. So remember, just as when Moses was born, Pharaoh was trying to wipe out all the Israelite males. And obviously, the enemy, Satan, sensing that it was time for deliverance to come and God's going to raise up a deliverer so Pharaoh wants to wipe them out in advance. He doesn't know what's coming, but he wants to wipe them out in advance. So the same with Herod here. He's specifically told about Messiah's about to be born in Bethlehem. So what does he do? He's got to wipe them out now. All right, it's all the, let's get a rough time frame here. Within two years, kill all the, the male babies in Bethlehem. So Joseph, being warned in a dream, flees. They go to Egypt, stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Well, if you'll share this with a, a rabbi or a counter-missionary, Jewish teacher, educator working against us, they'll say that's not a prophecy at all. In fact, that's completely taken out of context. In fact, the text says the opposite of what you think it says. And Matthew's trying to trick you. That's why he only quoted from the second half of the verse. 
if you look at the whole verse in Hosea, you'll see it has nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with the Messiah. It has to do with Israel. You'll see it's not even a prophecy. You'll see it's history, and you'll see it's not positive, it's negative. That's why Matthew only quoted half, and he's trying to trick you. So you go to Hosea, you think, okay, let's look at this. And, and you go to Hosea, and verse, chapter 11, verse 1, and to your surprise you read, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. So rabbis would say, number one, it's not a prophecy. It's looking back at history. Number two, the son there is not Jesus. It's Israel. Number three, it's, it's a rebuke of Israel. Correct. Exactly. And Matthew knew all of that, and he assumed when he quoted half the verse that his readers, Jewish readers, would know the whole verse. It's just like if I say, you know, for God so loved, well, you fill in the rest of the verse. What's his point? His point is that as it happened to Israel, the nation, in its infancy, Israel, God's firstborn son, called out of Egypt as a child, the same thing happened to the Messiah, God's greater firstborn son. All of this is a parallel. It's meant to be that. Matthew's quite aware of what he's saying and doing, and his understand, <coughs> excuse me, his understanding is that his readers will understand what he's doing. As it happened to Israel, so also it happened to Messiah. And strikingly, Israel is called God's firstborn son. Messiah is called God's firstborn son. And they're both, in their infancy, called out of Egypt by God. Parallels. As it happened to Moses, Pharaoh tries to destroy him before he's born. So what happened to Jesus? Herod tries to destroy him before he's born. As it happened to Israel, God's firstborn son called out of Egypt in infancy. The same thing with Jesus, or in their early years, called out of Egypt. The same way Psalm 41 is quoted by Jesus about Judas. The one who ate with me has lifted up his heel against me. He has betrayed me. You say, wait a second, Psalm 41, it talks about the psalmist's sin. David's talking about his own sin there in Psalm 41. How can that apply to Jesus? All Jesus is saying is just as David was betrayed by a close friend, so also I'm betrayed by a close friend. That's all. What's the point? The point is that the whole of the Hebrew Bible is pointing towards him. The point is that the whole of the Hebrew Scriptures is testifying to him. As it happens to Israel as a nation, as it happens to Moses, as it happens to David, so also it happens to the Messiah. These are not primary proofs. This is kind of like the, the decoration on the tree or the frosting on the cake. The primary proofs have to do with the explicit passages that speak of Jesus dying for our sins, like Isaiah 53, that speak of him rising and ascending to the right hand of God, like Psalm 110 that speak of his priestly ministry on our behalf, like Zechariah 6. These are the more explicit passages that speak of these things, and passages that would indicate that the Messiah had to come before the second temple was destroyed. All these are the foundational teachings. Then these other allusions, and as it happened to Israel, as it happened to David, as it happened to Moses, that's like I say, icing on the cake or decorations on the tree. Not only so, but because the writers of the New Testament were all Jews, with the possible exception of Luke, some would argue he was Jewish as well, but they were all living in the Jewish world, they also understood the Jewish mindset, Jewish forms of interpretation, and they sometimes used plays on words and things like that just like Jewish teachers did, just like the Hebrew Bible does. For example, in Genesis 11, it tells us that we have the name Babel, right? Babel, Babylon. We have the name Babel because there God confused the tongues. What's the Hebrew word for confused? Balal. So it's telling us we have the name Babel because there God balaled the tongues, confused the tongues. But that's not 
where Bavel comes from. Bavel, we, we all know, in ancient Semitic languages, would be Bab Elu, the gate of the gods. That's what it means. Bav El in Hebrew would mean the same thing, gate, gate of God, gate of the gods. So why does Genesis 11 get it wrong? It, it doesn't get it wrong. It's a play on words. It's not meant to give you a scientific definition or explanation. It's a play on words. Just like saying, yeah, they call him Mike because he always has a mic in his hand. No one's thinking that that's how I got my name. Here, I'll give you another example. Jacob, right? What does Jacob mean? Someone tell me, what does Jacob mean? Cheater. All right, you're going to name your kid Cheater? What should we name him? Let's name him Cheater. <laughs> oh, thank God, we're having a, a twins? All right, let's name, all right, you know, that come out. Okay, let's name this one. Right? It's like Harry. Look, okay, we'll name that one Harry or Re Re And that one we'll call Deceiver. Yeah. Or like Naval, Fool, right? What parent is going to name their kid Naval, Fool? The fact is, just like in English, there are different words that can have different meanings or words that sound alike the same in Hebrew, all right? So initially, why is he called Yaakov? Because he's grabbing the, the akev, the ankle, right? He's grabbing the ankle of his brother. So he's called Yaakov, ankle grabber. Let's name him ankle grabber. The, even there, it's a play on words, okay? Yaakov, from what we can tell from other Semitic languages meant something like he will protect, something like that. And it just could have been short for God will protect. In other words, it was a good name. But it also rhymed with the root for ankle, akev, okay? So let's call him ankle grabber. And it also sounds the same as the root for to deceive. So later on, your name is rightly called deceiver because you deceive. Just like saying, that's why they call you Mike because you're always holding the mic. In other words, just play on words. We may not know that reading it today, but someone reading it in ancient Israel would know that. The New Testament writers did that same kind of thing. So probably the, the most classic example, the, the most interesting example is found in Matthew, the second chapter. And it's one that's raised a lot of eyebrows over the years. Matthew chapter 2 Back there again. And he went, so Jesus went with the family, went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So, what, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Now, in your Bibles, does it have those words, he will be called a Nazarene in quotes? Yeah, that's how it is in the Bible in front of me. Well, there are no quotes when it was written in Greek. And there really shouldn't be quotes there because there's no verse that says that. Notice this. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, plural. The only time Matthew uses that formula and speaks of prophets, plural, not prophet singular, as the prophet Isaiah said or the prophet Jeremiah said, but prophets, plural. So he's talking about the testimony of Several prophets, figure at least three. I mean, it could be two, but it seems to be a plural number here. So Mr. Philip was said through the prophets, he'll be called a Nazarene. Well, when did the prophets ever say that? Well, it's not an actual verse. There's no verse that says it. The critics say, well, he made up a verse. He made up a verse. Well, that's a great way to win people who know the scriptures. Make up a verse to back your case especially when you have nothing to gain from it. There was nothing of significance, of prophetic significance that he lived in Nazareth. You know what I'm saying? It's not his death. It's not his resurrection. It's not the heartbeat of his message and ministry. Ah, well, on the one hand, what, what, did, what did Philip say when he heard about Nazareth in John 1? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? What? Messiah coming from Nazareth? You're kidding me? Nazareth? A little town in Galilee? What? We don't expect that. So on the one hand, it speaks of his lowliness and, and any of the prophets that spoke of that, his lowliness or his being rejected, that could tie in with that. But, but not only so, what's written in Isaiah 11.1, 1, one of the most important messianic prophecies in the whole Bible? It, it speaks of the, the root of Jesse, 
right? It's, it speaks of the, the branch, the stump. And the, the Hebrew word used there is, is netzer. There will be a netzer from Jesse, from David. And netzer is a play on words with Nazareth, Nazareth. So elsewhere, the Messiah is called a branch using a different word in Zechariah 3 and Zechariah 6. He's called Semach, the branch. Same word used in Jeremiah 23 and Jeremiah 33. The Messiah is there is called Semach, branch. Here, he's called branch using the word Netzer. And it seems what Matthew is doing is giving you a little hint. You've got to dig. I mean, this is, this is what scholars have seen, that Matthew's giving you something that if you'll dig, you'll discover. And it's one of these things, once you discover, it's like, oh, that's what he's talking about. So he wants you to look, okay, what's this, what's this hint? Well, on the one hand, the Messiah is a branch. That also speaks of his, his lowliness, just like a, you know, a twig or a shoot or a, you know, coming out of a stump. And specifically in Isaiah 11, 1, he's called a netzer, which is play on words with Nazareth, Nazareth. And then other prophets spoke of his lowliness and being rejected. That's what he's saying. He's saying that he lives there and it is an appropriate place to live as the prophets described. But you've got to dig to see where the prophets described it. That's what he's expecting you to do, to dig and make this discovery. But this is not a primary, our primary prophecy about Jesus being the Messiah. This, no, 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 it's not this. This is just decorations on the tree. This is icing on the cake. The passages that most clearly lay these things out are the larger indisputable texts, like Isaiah 53, which speaks of Messiah dying for our sins and yet being rejected by the nation. Like Psalm 110, which speaks of his exaltation to the right hand of God. Those are passages that carry even more weight that are more fundamental. Let me just give you one more example. Then we'll, we'll just take a, a stretch break and come back and answer your questions. Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is quoted verbatim by Jesus on the cross. Famous words... In Aramaic, would be Eli, Eli, Lama Shabbatani. So it's Hebrew and Aramaic. Hebrew, Lama Shabbatani, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the mocking words of the religious leaders quoted verbatim from Psalm 22. I mean, ironically, as Jesus hangs on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and I'm not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel, and you, our fathers, put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved, and you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I'm a worm and not a man. It goes on. Okay. Is this a messianic prophecy? Well, it's, it's not written as a prophecy. It's written as the experience of the psalmist. He's talking about his own experience and feeling forsaken by God and given over to his enemies. However, as we read the psalm, it seems to speak of a suffering beyond anything we know that happened in the life of David or someone else recorded in the Hebrew Scriptures. And not only so, it, it seems to speak of a certain type of suffering that looks very much like crucifixion, which did not exist in Old Testament times. The, the form of execution known as crucifixion was invented by the Persians, as far as we know. And then the, the Greeks learned it from the Persians, and the Romans learned it from the Greeks. And ultimately, because it was such a barbaric way to kill people, that, that the Romans ultimately stopped using it. So the psalmist is speaking here by divine inspiration. He's speaking of his own great sufferings and agony, and yet he's speaking of something beyond anything he ever experiences. In that sense, it's prophetic. And in that sense, Jesus fulfills it. Remember Matthew 5, 17, he didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. So he takes this psalm, which only had partial application in the life of the psalmist, and brings it to a full meaning. And by the way, it's very easy to write like that. When you're writing poetically, it's very easy to write in these these lofty terms that are, you know, impossibly exaggerated, and they seem real, but Jesus actually does it. He, he fulfills it. 
So the psalmist says, I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights them. This is what some of the mockers say as Jesus hangs on the cross. Yet you brought me up out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you've been my God. Do not be far from me for trouble's near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths wide against me. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. Our translations read, they've pierced my hands and my feet. Others would argue it says like a lion, they're at my hands and feet. In other words, mauling and tearing. Either way, a brutal description of what happens to the psalmist's hands and feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. This is such a vivid description of crucifixion. and such a vivid description of what happens to Jesus at this time that it's beyond striking. And yet when written, crucifixion didn't even exist as a method of punishment. Yet the picture painted is one that, that fits perfectly for crucifixion. And, and then what happens is the cry for deliverance, and then verse 22, I'll declare your name to my brothers in the congregation, I'll praise you. Verse 24, for he's not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He's not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. And then begins to proclaim what's going to happen in the future. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth will remember. Remember what? My great deliverance from the jaws of death. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. So here is the psalmist delivered from the jaws of death, and the deliverance is so great that people from the ends of the earth, people from around the world and future generations of Israel will serve God because of it. Only Messiah fulfills that. Whatever meaning it had in the context of the Old Testament, it was not fulfilled. It was not filled up to the full measure. Because the psalmist did not suffer that full level of suffering, nor was he delivered in such a way that brings praise to God to the ends of the earth. Jesus comes along because the whole Hebrew Bible is his and takes it to its fulfillment, dying for our sins, rising from the dead. You say, yeah, but it seems that the psalmist is, is delivered from death you know, before dying. Well, I ask, which is the greater deliverance from death? That you're delivered from a a temporary crisis only to die some years later, or that you were delivered from the jaws of death itself after dying, never to die again, exalted to the right hand of God, and which is going to bring greater praise to God to the ends of the earth. So, again, I just gave you a sampling, looked a little bit more in depth into the five books of Moses, but the whole point is to say that when rightly understood, all of the Hebrew Scriptures are pointing to Jesus the Messiah, but then in some very specific, foundationally important ways. They are directly prophesying about him. And that's what we present to our Jewish friends, how he would be a light to the Gentiles, yet rejected by his own people, as the prophet said. That when we was, he was dying, we would think he was dying for his own sins, and on and on. And we can even make a case that he had to die and rise before the second temple was destroyed. Therefore, there's one candidate and one candidate only who can fulfill the prophecies. All right, so let's do this. We will take a five-minute break. We'll come back with Q&A.